Well, good morning. And uh, my name's Pete. I'm one of the pastors here at Antioch, and we are so glad to have you with us this morning, especially if you are a guest or just visiting today. Uh, we want to welcome you, and uh, so glad that you're here. And uh, we hope that you'll, you'll be able to connect with God and others in a meaningful and authentic way today. And so as you know, it's Easter Sunday, which let's just be honest, it's pretty weird, isn't it, right? Who can tell me how we figure out when Easter is every year? I know somebody knows. Who's got it? It's in March or April. Somebody knows. Nobody knows. <laughs> the lunar calendar, who's got it? That's exactly right, which is very good. It'd be easier if there was just like, same as December 25th or something like that. But So you have this lunar calendar, right? And then we have this Jewish man 2,000 years ago who was executed and then rose from the dead. And so then we celebrate by painting eggs and hiding them in the yard and making the kids look for them because he's not dead anymore, right? But if it doesn't make sense, there's a rabbit, so that explains that, um, why there's eggs, and then we tend to wear pastels, and I know, it's just really weird, isn't it? And we can be honest about that, and some of you, even just hearing the word Easter, or even the idea of being in church, maybe you haven't been uh, to a church service before. Or maybe it's been a really long time since you've been to church, or at least since Christmas, right? For some of us, Easter or being in church in a Christian environment like this is actually terrifying. And you're not alone. Easter has scared many people over the years. Let me show you uh, a couple examples. <laughs> Next. It is a little scary, isn't it? A giant rabbit. <laughs> and parents think this is a good idea. Oh. Some of you remember that. A couple more. Just starts getting really weird, doesn't it? And then finally, some of you dudes are like, get me out of here. Um... So if you're feeling weird or out of place or like this whole lunar bunny resurrection egg pastel holiday is so strange and doesn't make any sense, I want to first of all say that's okay and secondly, I'm so glad you're here and thirdly, Easter's actually way weirder than you think. Let me tell you what I mean. So uh, one of the questions we love to ask around here when it comes to talking about the gospel of Jesus, the good news of who he is and what he's doing in the world, is I like to ask you to imagine a perfect world. In other words, if anything were possible, what kind of world would you want to live in? So I want to hear a couple, a couple thoughts. What would a perfect world look like? No war. No war. Absolutely. Everything is free. <laughs> nice. What else? What was it? Guys can fly? Dads. Cats can fly. That sounds like a terrible place. <laughs> Couple more. Perfect world. What would it look like? Candy every day. No sin? That's the pastor's kid right there. Did you all hear that? Good job, Em. <laughs> so we could keep going on and on and on. I love to do this. I've asked this question of people all over the country when it comes to talking about what is Jesus all about. And what's fascinating to me is that almost every group I talk to, it's like we have this shared vision for what a perfect world or what the world ought to be. And it doesn't matter if we're Christian or non-Christian or Muslim or Buddhist or atheist or uh, whatever it is, we all kind of have this innate human longing for this perfect world. And it's a world uh, like we've started to describe here, right? A world without war, a world without pain, a world without sickness and suffering and injustice and death, a world without racism, 
a world without terrorism or pollution or corruption. It would be a world without all of the most painful and horrific destructive things. And in its place, it would be a world full of life, a world full of love and harmonious relationships, a world where everybody had this overflowing sense of joy and meaning and relationships were connected and right as they should be and may or may not have flying cats. I don't know about that. But in general, isn't it interesting that pretty much every human, if we take just a moment to imagine a perfect world, we all see the same thing. And what we would have to admit is that the world we've just described isn't the world we currently live in, right? Because we live in a world that's full of pain and sickness and, and cancer and destruction. We live in a world where we long for deeper relationships and a greater sense of meaning and joy. But what I want to share with you this morning, and the reason we're here to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus, is because we have incredibly good news. What we have in the story of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection from the dead is a reason to be hopeful. And this is where, you know, where I said Easter's weirder than you think. Because Jesus has risen from the dead, we actually believe that that means one day, The world we've all just imagined, the world we all long for, is one day going to come true. It's not just bunnies and eggs and chocolate and peeps. Hope for the world. Let me show you why. In the book of Revelation, chapter 21, I want to read just a few verses. And this is the final two chapters of the Bible that give us a vision of what God has promised one day will come about in human history. And so it says this, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. And then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. What a crazy claim that the Bible holds forth that one day, God is going to make the world new again. And what we have is this picture where every tear is wiped away, where there's no more mourning or death or crying or pain, no more suffering or crime or starvation or disease, no more suicide, no more loneliness, no more divorce or AIDS or racism or stillbirths, no more country music, no more Yankee fans. (laughs) A beautiful world. And instead of all that, what does is, what is the prophecy say? That he's making everything new. That everything would be put back together. A world full of joy and meaning and wonder and love. And everything would be as it should be. Other passages throughout scripture, this isn't just in Revelation. Give us this glimpse of God's new world that it's going to be like people are building houses and living in them, planting vineyards and drinking of them. There's going to be great music and dancing, and, and, and this new world will be like this huge feast with amazing food and amazing wine. So it's an absolutely stunning vision, and it's better than the world we can imagine. And the promise is that this new world, when it comes to be, will go on forever without ever getting old, without ever decaying, without ever corrupting at all. And that's not even the best part about it. In verse 3, the prophecy says, they will be my people and God himself will be with them and be their God. That in addition to this world being whole and plentiful, physically and materially, there's also going to be this fulfillment at a spiritual level that the deepest desires of our souls, the hunger of our hearts for truth and meaning will be fulfilled by God himself as we know who we are and who we belong to. And so that, as crazy as it sounds, is what 
the Bible says human history is headed towards. And I would be surprised that even without knowing all of us, that there's a person in this room that says, ah, that sounds pretty bad. I hope that's not true. I hope the things just keep going the way they are. No, even if you can't believe in such a happy ending to the story of humanity, of course we would wish that this was true. Of course we would hope that there's a re story of redemption unfolding in the world that we live in. Which is why at the end of that verse, he says, write these things down because they're trustworthy and true. In what kind of scenario do you have to say, what I'm telling you right now is trustworthy and true? When it's hard to believe, when it sounds too good to be true, right? That's when we say, no, you got to believe me. I know this sounds crazy. I know this sounds ridiculous, but these words are trustworthy and true. So this is hard to believe. And, and here's what's so interesting. What we have in Easter is actually a moment in human history, on this planet, in this human race that we are part of, we have a moment where God's new world has already broken into our world. And so what I want to show you just briefly is that in the life, the ministry, and the work of Jesus, we actually have a reason to hold on to this crazy hope that one day God's going to make everything new again. And so Revelation tells of what's going to come one day in the future. The Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, John in your Bible, tell us of what has already happened on earth 2,000 years ago when Jesus comes and starts talking about this thing called the kingdom of God. And so let me read to you a story. It's actually the story of five different people who have encounters with Jesus and their life is forever changed. So as I read, pay attention for each of these five people. Matthew chapter 9, if you want to turn there with me. While he was saying this, a synagogue leader came and knelt before him and said, My daughter has just died, but come and put your hand on her and she will live. Jesus got up and went with him, and so did his disciples. Just then a woman who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak. She said to herself, if only I touch his cloak, I will be healed. Jesus turned and saw her. Take heart, daughter, he said. Your faith has healed you. And the woman was healed at that moment. When Jesus entered the synagogue leader's house and saw the noisy crowd and people playing pipes, he said, go away. The girl is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. And after the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took the girl by the hand, and she got up. News of this spread all throughout the region. As Jesus went on from there, two blind men followed him, calling out, Have mercy on us, son of David. And when he had gone indoors, the blind men came to him, and he asked them, Do you believe that I'm able to do this? Yes, Lord, they replied. And he touched their eyes and said, According to your faith, let it be done to you. And their sight was restored. Jesus warned them sternly, See that no one knows about this. But they went out and spread news about him all over the region. And while they were going out, a man who was demon-possessed and could not talk was brought to Jesus. And when the demon was driven out, the man who had been mute spoke. The crowd was amazed and said, nothing like this has ever been seen in Israel. Okay, incredible stories here. In just 16 verses, we have five people who are suffering the reality of the world that we live in right? We have a woman who has been chronically sick for many, many years, and doctors have tried everything to heal her body. We have this little girl who has died, and there's a gathering of mourners at her home for her funeral. We have these two blind beggars that have spent their entire life in poverty, being overlooked and ignored. And then we have this man in bondage by an evil spirit, unable to overcome these forces of darkness that have taken over him. And then Jesus shows up and walks into each of these people's lives. And he looks upon the sick woman and this dead child and these two blind men and this demon-possessed man. And there's this powerful thing that happens in each one of those 
stories. Remember in Revelation, we have this picture, this promise that God's new world is going to be one where there's no more death or mourning or crying or pain. And when Jesus shows up on earth, what happens? Where there's pain, he brings healing. Where there's mourning, he brings laughter. Where there's crying, he brings rejoicing. And where there's death, he brings resurrection. And these aren't just isolated stories in the Gospels. This is all over the Bible. Jesus does this stuff all the time. And ultimately, not, not only does Jesus have the power over sickness and over the, the evil presences and over the pain and suffering in the world, he has power over death itself as he raises this little girl back to life, but ultimately he himself is raised to life. My good friend Rick wrote this in his book that a pastor friend of mine told me that as he was preparing for a funeral once, he decided to go through the Gospels and see how Jesus dealt with funerals. What he discovered is that Jesus did not care for them much. Everyone he went to, he raised the person from the dead. Jesus doesn't do funerals, not even his own, right? <laughs> Jesus' life and ultimately his resurrection gives us a glimpse of God's new world. He gives us a peek at what it would it look like if the kingdom and reign of God came onto this planet and touched down on this turf where we know sin and death and suffering and pain and injustice, what would it look like for God to actually show up in our world? Well, it would look like the person of Jesus showing up as a man and saying, I'm with you. I'm one of you. I'm going to live with you. I'm going to die for you, and I'm going to raise from the dead to show you that this world has hope. That this isn't how the story ends. That one day everything will be made right again and everything sad will come untrue. So what does this mean? Briefly, first of all, if Jesus has risen from the dead, as crazy as that sounds, then there is hope for this world. There is hope for this world. N.T. Wright says it like this, that the message of the resurrection is that this world matters that the injustices and pains of this present world must now be addressed with the news that healing, justice, and love have won. If Easter means Jesus Christ is only raised in a spiritual sense, then it's only about me and finding a new dimension in my spiritual life. But if Jesus Christ is truly risen from the dead, Christianity becomes good news for the whole world. News which warms our hearts precisely because it's not just about warming hearts. Easter means that in a world of injustice, violence, and degradation are endemic, God is not prepared to tolerate such things, that we will work and plan with all the energy of God to implement the victory of Jesus over them all. So take away Easter, and Karl Marx was right to accuse Christianity of ignoring problems of the material world. Take it away, and Freud was right to say Christianity is wish fulfillment. Take it away, and Nietzsche was right to say it was for wimps. But if Easter is true, then there is hope for this world. For all the pain, for all the injustice, for all the suffering that occurs both within us, in our home, in our community, in our city, and all around the world, Easter means that God hasn't given up on this project, that God hasn't abandoned us. And that God is going to do for his entire creation what he did when he raised his son Jesus back from the dead. That there is hope for humanity, and this is a unique vision. There's no other worldview, philosophy, or religion that holds out this kind of hope for the world that we live in. There's lots of teachings that can say, here's how to make your life better, or here's how to find meaning, or here's how to live a really good life. But there's no one else that claims that there is a salvation as big as the world that's promised. And so first of all, if the tomb is empty, that means there's hope for the world. And second of all, it means that there's hope for you. It means that God hasn't given up on you. That God hasn't abandoned you or turned his back on you. But he, in his great love, in his great faithfulness, and in his great power, has done everything possible to come 
to us, into our world, to love you, to pull you into himself so that you can be part of his new world forever. The invitation of the resurrection is that God is making all things new, including you. And the question that Jesus asks those two blind men in Matthew 9 is, do you believe that I'm able to do this? Yes, Lord, they replied. Then he touched their eyes and said, according to your faith, let it be done to you. And their sight was restored. That's the question I would ask you this morning. I know this is hard to believe, that there's hope for the world, and some of us hard to believe that there's hope for our life, that God could love us, that God wants us, that he wants us to be part of what he's doing. It sounds too good to be true, but in Jesus we have reason to believe that this promise is coming about and that this God loves you more than you could ever know. And so my question is, do you believe this? Will you choose to believe this? Will you trust Jesus as the one, the only one, who can not only save you, but can save the entire world? Will you place your hope and your trust in that person? And if not, who are you going to trust more than him? Which religious leader, which poet, which philosopher, which politician is more trustworthy than the God who became one of us, who suffered and died and rose again for us. My hope and my heart, my prayer for each and every one of you this morning, will you believe this? Will you choose to trust your entire self to Christ and receive his life as your own? And as you do, this resurrection revolution becomes part of who we are and we become part of who he is and we get to join God on his mission of making everything new again. I don't know about you, that sounds like something I could get excited about way more than bunnies, eggs, or flying cats. This is good news. So as the band comes, we're going to respond and we want to invite you to come and receive communion if you'd like. You don't have to, but if you would like to come and take the bread and take the cup, this is one of the most intimate and beautiful expressions of love that God has given us. And my heart is that you would come this morning to receive Christ, whether for the millionth time or the first time, as we take the bread and the cup into ourselves. So would you stand and pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, we declare you as the king of the world. There is no one like you. There is no one who has done what you have done or promised to do what you have promised to do. You alone are our hope for our own lives, for our families, for our community and our city, and hope for the nations. God, and so even though it is incredibly hard to believe at times, even though there is so much reason for us to fear, for us to doubt, the tomb is empty. You have overcome our greatest enemy. You have defeated death. And so my, my prayer this morning, God, for this gathering today, that each one of us, you would give us the faith to believe this, to believe this story. And Holy Spirit, that raised Jesus from the dead, would you raise the dead in us? Would you redeem the broken parts of our hearts? Would you reconcile our broken relationships with you and ourselves and everyone else? And would you redeem these lives to fill us with your life and your joy and your mission in the world? So we say yes to you. Yes, we believe. We trust that you are our hope and the hope of the world. For your glory, in Jesus' name.